So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Roshad. I'm representing Darko Health Hub. It's a startup hub, um, co-working space, accelerator, incubator in Helsinki, May Lofty. Um, and as you know, we're organizing these health talks together with all those actors whose logos you can see on the screen. Uh, idea is to bring uh, educational uh, content on health and life science entrepreneurship to uh, at least uh, entire Finland and uh, and everyone outside is also welcome to join as well. Um, today we have the privilege of uh, having High Life specifically and Inar uh, to organize this event. And I'm going to give uh, the floor to Stephanie uh, from Inar to talk, uh, to host the event. And before that, I just want to say that, so we have uh, several speakers. Uh, you can ask questions um, after the speech ends, but we, we, will, we will have time only for a few questions after each speech. Um, but we'll have a big general Q&A session at the end. Um, you can also just type your questions in the chat. Uh, Stephanie will read them out to the speakers. Uh, or in the breaks, you can just turn on your camera and your mic, just uh, ask them directly. So, um, yeah, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rashad. So welcome to the Planetary Health Innovation Talks. Um, I'm really excited to, to host uh, today. My co-host is Chiara, who uh, unfortunately lost her voice. So I will introduce her for, for her. Um, Chiara is the coordinator of the innovation activities at High Life. And High Life is a University of Helsinki Institute. It is the Helsinki Institute for Life Science at the University of Helsinki. And they're connecting life science researchers across different campuses and faculties to solve the grand challenges related to health, food, and the environment. Uh, High Life has also been focused uh, in promoting innovation with activities like today, the Health Talk series, of which they have been a partner since last year. And they also have an event called Why Science, which is an official side event of Slush, and it's focused on life science innovation, and it will be back this year for its fifth edition. Now, myself, I'm Stephanie, and I am from the Institute of Atmospheric and Earth System Research of University of Helsinki. We are a multidisciplinary research unit working um, mainly with climate change and air quality challenges. Um, we are also heading the new Finnish flagship, the Atmosphere and Climate Competence Center, the ACCC, um, and we're working to co-create knowledge-based solutions together with our stakeholders in policy and uh, private sectors. So uh, some of our business partners include the sectors in energy, transport, technology, and forestry. So um, we're also very much moving towards working with research and innovation. So a very brief introduction to why planetary health, why the topic of planetary health innovation. And it's because we know that we have to move um, away from uh, working on siloed um, solutions to challenges that we're facing, like human health, like uh, the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. And we have to be able to tackle them as one, one whole, as a systems um, uh, approach. So the concept of planetary health is not new, um, but it was revived in 2015 with the Rockefeller Foundation and Lancet Commission report on planetary health. And the authors, they put it simply, they say, planetary health is the health of a human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. So basically planetary health is saying that both climate, environment, and also human health are interlinked and we have to treat them as, as such. So the authors also also comment something which is very relevant to today's talk, and that is that it is not enough to just understand the problem, but we also have to be able to monitor the problem, to prioritize it uh, as, a, as a very important problem that we have to work on, and then finally to act on it. And that's exactly what our speakers today will be will be doing. So um, I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker. He is Andrew Ribeiro Hargrave. He's from uh, Megasense, the CTO at Megasense and senior researcher at University of Helsinki. So he will be um, bringing us an air quality topic. Um, Andrew, if, if I can now give you the floor. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen. OK. 
Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you um, for giving us the opportunity to present our solution. And um, I have 15 minutes to talk about Megasense. Um, Megasense, um, we're from the um, University of Helsinki. Uh, I'm a senior researcher in the Department of Computer Science, but we work closely with uh, INAR and the Atmospheric Science Partners. I'm also um, Megasense, um, let's call it spin out or spin off um, CTO. So we have this um, this solution, this research solution we've been working on for the last three or four years, and now we bring it to the market. Now it's about um, providing solutions for air pollution and air, poor air quality. And I don't need to really um, specify what air, what, poor, what air pollution is and poor air quality. Um, most cities in the world um, suffer from uh, air pollution at some, some uh, stage and some worse than others. So we are working together to uh, provide this um, holistic and uh, large scale solution. So first of all, Megasense, breathing uh, in clean air has many benefits. Well, we know that um, clean air reduces the chances of lung, heart and artery diseases. Clean air uh, gives you cleaner lungs, uh, decreases asthma and allergy symptoms. Um, but there are other issues, um, benefits of clean air. So we have improved skin appearance, um, uh, high PM 2.5 and pollutants uh, does lead to poor skin. Um, it also helps with digestion, um, poor air sort of, um, cause you ingest the, the air that you breathe. In fact, you're, you're breathing in 40, 50 liters uh, a day of, of air. It uh, affects your psychological and uh, emotion. The, um, so clean air, makes people feel better. It gives them better mood and uh, helps with normalized sleep patterns. And um, to some extent, um, it's been seen that clean air sort of reduces crime and poverty rates. So now let's get to the next slide. So Megasense, um, I'm gonna go through everything. Megasense is a, is a history of new sensors and cloud services uh, coming from the University of Helsinki. And um, we started off in uh, 2018 with um, university seed funding. And uh, we received um, Academy of Finland um, funding. And our idea was to create um, a fixed IoT network of low cost devices. So you put these low cost devices in different parts of the cities, you can get uh, dense air quality readings at a very low cost and at a very fast rate. Um, we've been, we worked with the city of Helsinki, we called it uh, Urban Sense Innovation Funds. Um, and we sort of mapped the air quality um, of the surrounding of our campus and surrounding areas. Um, we've also had um, Funding from the EU was part of um, a larger consortium called HOPE. And here we provided low cost sensors and um, an app for people to measure their air quality exposure, personal exposure, wherever they are. So they carried these small little devices around and uh, be it indoors, outdoors, they can measure their exposure to the atmospheric gases, to the particles and environmental changes. We've also um, provided these services, these small devices, plus um, apps um, for a more industrial uh, consortium. So we had a Business Finland uh, project called Megasense Smart City. And here was working with players such as Nokia, Finnish Meteorological Institute. And uh, here we provided small, small devices with their apps and we sent them to different um, cities of the world. And we also provided a model, um, air quality model. So from, from this background, then um, we have a spin out or spin off that was um, introduced last year at Slush. So we said that um, the university is spinning out this research to form a company. This company is being formed um, as we speak. Um, hopefully uh, by the end of the month, we'll actually have the Megasense OI. And I'll talk about a little bit of what we um, intend to do. Um, the reason being is um, we're focusing on uh, solutions, software solutions, supported with low cost sensors. So although we have small devices, the, our focus is on software. And I'll explain that the, the, the market is quite large for this type of solution. Now, 
Mega says, how to breathe clean air. Now, our, our challenge is how do we model an entire city? Now, often um, this is very difficult to do when you think of cities, they're huge. Um, there's a lot of things happening within one day. Um, and it's very difficult to actually use uh, equipment to monitor uh, devices in real time and also fo forecast the air quality when you have changing climate and all sorts of changing uh, parameters such as the traffic. So a very brief um, way that we do it, we do it by modeling. So we model the, um, the traffic. So here we on the left, we have city traffic simulation. Um, we take a city, this city is Quito, for example, we've done this for five cities. And we, we model the probabilistic traffic emissions. So it's based on real data, such as the number of trips in one day and vehicles, and we move that um, around the city. Now, now, the main reason why we do this is to create traffic emissions. Now, these traffic emissions, they feed into a high resolution air quality model, an air quality model that takes these emissions and then disperses them according to meteorological inputs and other uh, global inventory values. And we disperse the pollution across the city. And of course, we're not only create the model, the model is validated according to ground observations. Now, this ground observation is what actually is measuring the air pollution, uh, be it city stations or low cost air quality monitors. And then more importantly, what is the solution? Now, the current solution we have is a clean air routing application. It's on a mobile, it's also on a web desk. Um, and here it, it allows um, subscribers or whoever uses the device to avoid the sort of most polluted streets and get statistics about the streets that they're walking on. Now, this is perfect for someone who's cycling, someone who's jogging, some walkers. Um, and here they can have a choice of taking different types of routes. It's very much a navigation uh, tool and it works in real time. Now, what we're doing in Megasense is we're doing this modeling from Finland and it's for any city. A little bit about the validating of the device. And here we have how it works. So on the right is our sort of model of emissions that we create again for Quito. This is how we see the traffic uh, changing in time uh, across a sort of 12 hour period. Um, we then compare we, from that, we go right to the left and we provide a pollution, uh, how these um, emissions are sort of dispersed by pollution, taking in the, the weather conditions, taking in uh, air mixing conditions, many factors. And then we, um, we, uh, we validate those pollutants according to low cost sensors and these dots that are moving are us. The ones that are, are fixed are the, um, are, are the the city monitoring stations and the ones that are moving, there'll be some moving, are people carrying these devices. So, so we collect that data, we uh, then put it um, on our platform, and then we look at the emissions again, and then we look at the pollutants again, and then we look at the low cost sensing. So through uh, our platform and using um, our AI techniques, we can sort of provide quite good um, forecasts for entire cities, uh, again, using pure, uh, modeling and accessing data that we can or providing small devices to to validate this but the um the main um output for um for a user is they're not really interested in how we model air quality um across the city they just want a tool so here we have um a clean air routing tool. Uh, here it's, it's based because we're working very closely with the Fish Meteorological Institute and we're using their psyllium model. Here it's like um, how you can avoid NO2 in a city. Again, we're just to keep it um, aligned. This is Quito. Um, so the agent there wants to go get from uh, uh, point A to B. And so um, at the different times of day. Now, the red route would be. Um, the fastest navigation route, if you're cycling, if you're running, or however you're doing it. Um, the green route would be the healthiest navigation, and that is it, avoiding um, the sort of pollution within that hour. And the yellow route is the most convenient navigation. So, of course, there's a trade-off that uh, if you want to avoid a polluted street or you want to take the healthiest route, sometimes that could increase your trip. Um, by 20% of your time. So you, you might not want to do that. So you want to look for something that's more convenient, that sort of midway between the, um, the red route 
and the yellow route. Now, th this is what we have running. Um, we have this green pass running in Helsinki, um, very much based on this type of solution. We have modeled this for four or five cities. Um, we also, when you're walking or when you're moving, um, it's very much like this sort of Google. So here was just one view, but you can sort of walk and, and when you do the navigation and you see yourself moving as, um, as a dot, um, you, we have that solution as well. So the real time walking there and getting the values and all this data is collected as statistics. So then you can store them in your history and you can see that um, this route was, um, and this value, my exposure was that for PM 2.5, for the gases, for noise as well. Um, and then you can build yourself uh, a library in your subscription of your exposure. And, um, and eventually you can share this information. So this really enables you to um, look after your own health when you go out to the cities, when you go walking, to understand a little bit more what, um, what your personal exposure is to atmospheric gases and to particles. So that's, that is, the, um, is our solution at the moment. And as a company, um, we are sort of going to release this service uh, for Greater London. So um, what you're seeing here is an older version. The newer version will be um, much, uh, much more nicer and provide more information. But um, we see that in London, there are a lot of um, cyclists, there are a lot of joggers. There's a lot of issues about um, their exposure to air pollution in different parts of the city. And so we provide this solution for these um, uh, potential subscribers or potential users to know better and to take action for themselves and also to take action um, um, talking to the um, local authorities that you know why is this particular uh, particular street always at such a heavy sort of no2 pm2.5 co whatever um, we want to sort of work with so really that that's the navigation tool and why mega sense well the mega sense is that we're doing all this with computation we're doing this all this with computation and using open source data to validate those computations and it makes it very cost effective because um, we're not setting up any big infrastructure we will um, as a product as a product line we will sell these small devices so people can validate their, uh, their own personal exposure uh, and that's what this last slide is so um put it mega sense clean air at a personal level here we do have these small devices um because our model is a model and we can get close to reality, but these small devices are, are very good. You can carry them. This is an example of what we made. Um, and here you can measure the, um, the very small particles, the ultra fine particles and trace gases that affect citizens and workers, health and safety. And you, as you move through your city or within your house. Now we, we have uh, sensors in which we physically measure the coarse and fine particles of PM 2.5 and, and 2.5. That's the capabilities of this device. And we're making these devices for cyclists and for runners as well. But then we use our data, our Megasense platform, and we use so-called virtual parameters. And here we can estimate the, um, the, the proportion of black carbon and LDSA, the amount of fine dust that gets deposited on your lungs um, we do this, we collect the data, we compare this with reference devices, the so-called black carbon. So these very ultra fine particles, um, we can sort of calculate how much um, you have sort of ingested um, based on, um, on the values that we've measured and based on certain other parameters. So, so we have this so-called AI functionality based on machine learning algorithms that can say that you've brought it, you've You've uh, ingested this amount of dust. We calculate out of this amount of dust, 30% is black carbon. And that 30% is what will go through your body, into your brain and into the rest of your organs. So um, again, this is not something that we, you need to go to uh, any health service to do that, but you can get indicative values and take action when you need to, because this black carbon, you know, um, it really does affect people's health. And uh, what we try to do is to provide these services, these modeling services, and eventually these sensors um, to improve people's awareness of air pollution, to take action 
for themselves, but also to take action in their peer groups and hopefully influence their local governments to also take action in terms of restricting um, the emissions from traffic and emissions from construction sites, and also to move to more cleaner um, solutions such as um, electrified traffic uh, solutions and more cycling. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure what my timing is, but um, so I'm Andrew Rivero Hargrave at Helsinki.fi. Um, but um, we'll be launching the Megasense. We announced the launch this year at Slush, and we'll provide the service beginning of next year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. You were right uh, within your time, so so thank you for that too. Um, if you have, if there are any short questions, please add them to the chat or um, go ahead and, and speak up. Otherwise, we'll be taking them at the end, as Rashad mentioned. A very quick question for me, though. Um, you mentioned that it is a way that people can um, take action and also ask of their governments or their, um, yeah, decision makers to to improve the conditions of, of air. Um, how about the other way around? You, you did mention that you work with different uh, in different programs, Megasense is, is linked to different programs. So what is then the regulation bodies? How are they working with you to actually take your data and your products and your results and then feedback, use that as feedback for their uh, decision making? Okay, um, yeah, so, we, so in Helsinki, we worked with the Environmental Services, HSY, and um, so they're very interested in 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 our readings, um, but there is a little bit of um, of a sort of let's say I wouldn't say conflict, but a mismatch between what is regulatory and what their focus is. So their focus is more about meeting the regulations of um, set by the EU, set by government bodies, um, to be below a certain value on a spatial um, spatial basis. Whereas our focus is more about the people and their exposure. So. Um, we, uh, we we work with them. We compare our values, and and that's still an ongoing discussion. So um, so when you think about air quality, you can think about the regulators, the, the people who regular you know doing the following the regulations, imposing them, making sure we're below on a spatial level thirty microns of, uh, per hour exposure. Um, but then that's it. That's where they that's where their interest stops. Whereas uh, what we want to do is enable people to measure, even if it's five microns um, that they're ingesting or 10, to take actions on the very, very low measurements and also to take action when it's uh, quite high in a temp, uh, sort of uh, on a small scale. Because what the regulations do, they, they, they so it's an average. It's based on an average, um, sort of a mean average of a number of days per year. Um, you shouldn't go above this value, but that doesn't help the people very much. Um, and, it, and, and, you know, if people have health issues or are interested in, in, in these type of measurements, uh, be an elderly person uh, with a lung problem, you know, we don't provide health data, but we, we provide this indicative data so they can take actions and, and they can then discuss this with their local authorities. But we do work with the local authorities. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. So we'll come back uh, at the end in the Q&A se session. Thank you. So um, I will now introduce the, our next speaker. So Dalia Freitag, she's from Dalen Animal Health and she is the founder and chief science officer at Dalen Animal Health. Um, she's also associate professor at the Karl Francis Universität in Graz. And uh, I would like to just additionally mention that the Dalan Animal Health is a spin-off of University of Helsinki, and the initial research um, happened during her work at the university, but she will explain it much better. So, uh, Dalia, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Sarah, so very much, and thanks for inviting me to tell about um, insect vaccines. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people ask why would one care about insect health because a lot of people see insects as something annoying and, and bugging and, and something to get rid of rather than uh, to safeguard. But I hope I'll convince you that insects are very crucial for uh, human health and for planetary health. So we don't talk about only having nice fuzzy insects around, but it is actually really, really crucial for our survival. So um, why insects? Uh, why do I study insects? So first of all, 
they are really ancient uh, creatures on Earth. And uh, first arthropods uh, appeared on Earth like around 450 million years ago, and first flying insects about 380 million years ago. Right now, there are about 1 million species described with estimates that there are 4 more million species undescribed insects. And probably most of them will never get to know because we, they are dying in, in, uh, in rap rapidly uh, and very fast. So especially in the tropical areas where the deforestation is taking place, so we'll probably never get to know with whom we actually share the planet. Um, insects also is just very fascinating and cool. If you look at all the diversity they have, they live everywhere. They have the coolest adaptations to environment and to the body plants. And among insects, we are truly we have truly a eusocial organism. So if we humans think we are social, it's nothing in compared to the ant mound or to the beehive, for example. So they are just fascinating, and their biomass outweighs the biomass of mammals and humans on Earth. So they are really, really very important for functioning of our planet. So why we should be alarmed about the state of insects on Earth is because there are several studies done uh, to capture what is happening with them. Um, but maybe one of the first papers what was published in 2017 and what was a long-term study what was reporting on the temporal distribution of insects and especially insect biomass uh, in German um, nature preservation areas showed that we have lost about 75% of insect biomass. And that is very, very alarming. That's why the headlines like the insect apocalypse here is, is true. We are losing both biomass and biodiversity. Why is it so important? What do insects do for us? Well, they are very important, for example, for soil aeration. What does it mean that, well, existence of insects allows us to grow food. So if, uh, if a soil does not have well, aeration, the plants will not grow as well. So basically, um, that affects our crops. They are also very important in the food chain for different organisms, including actually for humans, 80% of the planet is consuming insects on a regular basis. So they are actually also part of the staple food in many areas, but of course they are also important uh, foods for the birds, for example. That's, it's already shown that in, in many areas, uh, 40 to 80% of insectivorous birds have been lost because they have nothing to eat. In addition to that, they do seed dispersal, they important in nutrient cycling. Also, they uh, uh, are functioning as a carbon sink, for example, big ant mounds. They are very essential for plant diversity. So basically, if we think about uh, biodiverse forests or meadows, these are actually insects who are quite often carrying these, these little seeds around. And most important of it all, of course, insects are very, very important in pollination, of both wild and managed crops. So again, if we think about flowering plants, then which one of us does not enjoy walking in a meadow, walking in a forest and seeing all these flowers? Well, we will not have them anymore if there are no pollinating insects around. And it's estimated that pollination services are worth about 235 to 577 billion per year. So it's really hard to put exact price on it. It depends on the region, but it's a lot of money. What does it mean for us if we lose pollinating insects, including among them the managed pollinators such as honeybees? It will mean malnutrition for millions around the world. And now, of course, in the face of a growing population on the planet, it's very, very alarming uh, development. Because yes, we will not starve to death. We can still grow rice, we can still grow wheat, but uh, high quality foods such as uh, vegetables and fruits will be extremely expensive. So not many people can afford them if we do not have pollinators. So in, in some areas on the planet, people are already pollinating. Uh, different fruits and vegetables with hand, and we all understand that that's not very sustainable in the long run. So we really, really need our pollinators. 
So why are we losing insects? It's not really a secret. There are three main causes. It's a habitat loss of nutritional deficiency. So if we destroy their uh, habitats and grow monocultures, well, they have nothing to eat and they have nowhere to live. Then uh, there's a use of complex pesticides, uh, water spray in the environment in high amounts. And then upon that, we will have diseases because you have to imagine if you're starved and you're poisoned, there is a high probability to get sick. Um, what can we do against all these things? Of course, we can say, let's uh, be more sustainable, let's uh, improve biological agriculture, but let us also deal with insect diseases. And for that, of course, antibiotic treatments are very discouraged, especially if we talk about managed honeybees because there are residues in their products like honey or wax, but also in environments so we need better solutions to tackle insect diseases. In order to do that, we need to understand how does insect, but in this case, more particularly, honeybee immune system work. What we do know is that bees have very fascinating immune uh, strategies. Since they are truly eusocial organisms, they have two level of uh, defenses. They have a colony level defenses. So this has a lot of behavioral aspects. Uh, and then they have individual level defenses, but also contain uh, a lot of behavioral aspects as well as mechanical like immune system itself, different antimicrobial peptides and enzymes. We also know how uh, insects, in this case honeybees, are recognizing the pathogen. So they are actually able to mount very specific immune responses. Now, for example, when a honeybee queen is uh, exposed to bacteria, such as, for example, American fall brood, that is one of the most devastating diseases in the world, and uh, if you find it in your hives, you need to quarantine it and literally burn it. That's the that's treatment right now. So what happens if a queen is exposed to it, um, as many bacterial diseases, it enters the organism via digestive system. The bacteria digest it, broken into pieces, transferred to the chemosol or a body cavity, where they are activating um, immune responses. And uh, among other things, they are being stored in a specific organ called fat body. In fat body, there is another um, uh, very special uh, process taking place, it's, uh, namely synthesis of vitellogenin. Vitellogenin is the oldest egg yolk uh, protein in animals. And each one of us who eats, for example, eggs, um, uh, is eating it actually in that case on a daily basis. It's a, it's a yellow of the egg. And the function of uh, vitellogenin is to provide the nutrition for developing embryo. And that's the same function it uh, has in the honeybee. Now, while vitellogenin is synthesized in a fat body and transferred to the ovaries, where it's deposited into the eggs and later uh, serves as a nutritional source for a honeybee larvae, uh, we also know that vitellogenin is carrying the little pieces of bacterium with it. So basically, once the mother has encountered certain pathogens, it can send this signal to her progeny, and we call this drunk generation immune priming. And this uh, specific mechanism was first uh, described by me and my colleague Heli Salmela and our collaborator, Ku uh, Amdern from US in Helsinki University in 2000. Um, uh, this, uh, since this mechanism and uh, this technology was very promising and we thought, well, this actually could be a way to start to develop vaccination approach for honeybees. We applied for funding. That time it was still called Tegas. Now it's uh, Business Finland. And we got funding to start to commercialize this idea of insect vaccination, honeybee vaccination, using this transgenerational immune priming as a mechanism. And that's how Prime Bee was born. And that lasted from 2017 to 2018. And uh, in the December, so basically almost in the very end of 2018, 18, it led to the formation and founding of a spin-off company called Dalton Animal Health, where I teamed up with Annette Kleiser and Francisca Tito. And so we were the three founders and took this technology out of university to the real world to test 
how it can do, how we can actually bring it to the market. So since the Dawn has been founded, we've been kind of diving in into the need of the industry and realize that situation is even more dire than we maybe thought before. Uh, up to 50% of hive losses in the industry are due to diseases and it leads to up to one third of decreased profit margin for beekeepers, but it's of course bad for any business. But also more importantly for each one of us, it leads to a decreased crop yield for crop growers and decreased food security worldwide. So it touches really everybody. Bees are doing badly. We all will suffer from it. So it is clear that there is a critical need for better solutions uh, for beekeepers. The solutions need to be proven scientifically, vigorously tested, tested. They need to be safe, they need to be effective, preferably non-chemical and non-GMO because there's a lot of development towards the uh, sustainable agriculture and sustainable technologies. And there's a lot of skepticism about GMO, but also basically it would mean it preferably the technology and solution should be organic. So the more and more we understand how immunity works in honeybees, it will allow us to develop methods to improve resilience to disease. So what we are doing is literally, uh, is literally we can call it controlled activation of the immune system. And it can do this immune priming, it can protect against specific diseases. Uh, we can assume it could also increase defenses against other diseases as, as we know in humans. So if you get vaccinated against one strain of virus, quite often you might be also a little bit more resistant against other viruses. And of course, if you are already more resilient to diseases, your overall performance will be better. So um, let me just show you a little bit of a data of what we've been collecting in Dalan to show that technology works and that we can protect against specific diseases is um, our first vaccine is targeting American fall brood, like I mentioned before. We've been setting up experiments where we have hives in which larvae are not prime, so literally queen has not been exposed to the vaccine, or we can call it a placebo. And then we have hives that contain primed larvae. In this case, the queen has been vaccinated. And results are very clear in the case of uh, vaccination and consecutive infection with uh, high amounts of um, uh, virulent spores of American fall fruit bacterium, uh, the individuals who've been primed survive significantly better com compared to the placebo controls. So, what Dowland is bringing on the market is first in class patent protected technology, which is effective and very simple to use. So this is how it works. Uh, we'll place in then we will consume this fact, they digest it, they transfer it to the head glands that produce royal jelly. Then the worker bees feed the royal jelly. Uh, which is containing a bacteria to the queen bee. Queen bee digests this and stores the vaccine particles in her fat body. There she's transferring it to the ovaries where the eggs are developing. And later, once the larvae are being born, they are more resistant against the infection. So this is, in a way, very classical approach to vaccination, but it's also very effective and simple to be combined with the current beekeeping practices. So our priming technology sets a new way for vaccine development in a field it has never happened before. So this is the insect health. And we are also pursuing the development of uh, vaccines against other diseases. And uh, our vaccines are regulated by the Center of Veterinary Biologics. So they, that means they go through a very vigorous testing. We really need to show that they work before we are getting the license to bring it on the market. And um, hopefully when it gets approved very soon, we hope for that, it will be the very first vaccine for honeybees, but also very first vaccine for insects um, as we know it. And with that, I would like to thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. 
Thank you very much, Dalia. Uh, you also kept within your time very well, so thank you again for that. Um, uh, again, I would like to invite participants to uh, chat, to put in their chat uh, questions, or of course, then we'll have a, a more open discussion later on. But a very quick question. You mentioned that you're waiting now for the approval of, of the vaccine. Do you already have plants or of honeybee farmers waiting for your vaccine uh, in, in, and where? So we, our entry market is U.S because Dowland is located in US right now. We just moved to Athens, Georgia, actually. So it's been a very good move for us. It's uh, very important for bee research as well. And yes, we have uh, beekeepers who are desperately waiting for the product. So, and we've uh, made a lot of contacts. No, that's that's really that's really really good. I hope you get that very quickly. Um, we will get into a, a, a bigger discussion afterwards. So I'll I'll just move to the next speaker. Uh, um, and the third, third and last speaker for today. So I would like to uh, thank you, Dalia, and welcome Mari Ganstrup, Origin by Ocean. She is a chief science activist and founder at Origin by Ocean. So Mari, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank and you very much. See, I hope you can, see, your can uh, see my slides. You can see them? Yes. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. About, first of all, sorry about my voice. I'm done with the COVID, so um, it might happen that I lose my voice uh, during the presentations. I just need to drink some water, so I should be uh, I should be okay. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to uh, be here today to talk about the planetary health. It's very close to my heart, and I really like your uh, opening words, Stephanie, when you were mentioning that. We have to combine these different ways of functioning on this planet so everything is related to each other and that's why i think the current problems we are facing um, are very layered and very very difficult so we need a lot of different type of players to tackle tackle these environmental problems we are facing and it's been very nice to learn about the honeybees so now we will go from honeybees to the oceans so uh, my name is Mara Granström. I'm the founder of Origin by Ocean, and I also uh, call myself a chief science activist. Um, we want to keep the titles a bit different in our company, and there is a reason for it, um, as we want to tackle also the business models from a, from a bit of a different angle. Um, Origin by Ocean was founded in 2019. Uh, it has been a hobby of mine as, I, as an idea, uh, before it had a name of it in by ocean. Um, basically, the idea started from the passion for the oceans and also for the deep worry. Um, oceans are suffering from several very severe problems at the moment, and all the marine ecosystems are taking a very hard hit from the human uh, created problems. And that's what I wanted to start to kind of an ideate how we could build a value chain based on environmental problem and turn that into a big business opportunity. Um, so I have a PhD in organic chemistry. I actually graduated from University of Helsinki a long time ago. And after that, I have worked in an industry, in a chemical industry. So I work for BSF and, and Stura and so. And uh, I have always looked the world uh, through the lenses of uh, biochemicals, biomaterials, biomass, biorefinery. So um, I'm kind of a bio person in, in that sense. And, uh, and that's something um, I've been working with basically in my entire career. So um, I will tell you today very shortly um, what we do at Origin by Ocean and why we say that we are washing the oceans and how do we, how do we actually do that? So I think we all know that um, the origin of life um, on this planet uh, started from the oceans. Um, the oceans are a very, very important part of our, of our ecosystem as a whole. Um, they are actually generating the oxygen we breathe, um, which I think is a, it's a fairly nice favor <laughs> from, this, uh, from this water body. Um, they also regulate the climate we have, so all the storms, all the sunny days like today in, in Helsinki, and, uh, and they give us food and shelter. Unfortunately, I think we humans, uh, we have not been treating the oceans as well as they have been treating us. And hence, we are seeing these very severe environmental problems. 
Uh, one of them is being eutrophication. So eutrophication means that you have an excess of nutrients in, in, the, in the water body, in the ocean, or in the lake, or in the river. And um, if you were born uh, around the Baltic Sea, you are well aware of the eutrophication. We are brought up with this problem. Uh, we understand the Baltic Sea is one of the most polluted seas in this world. However, this is not just a problem of the Baltic Sea, but the eutrophication is happening in all around the world, in all the big oceans. Um, and this is one of the things we want to tackle. So what happens when you have uh, eutrophications? You start to see uh, appearance of these invasive algae and seaweed blooms. And they are very bad for the marine ecosystem. So you will end up having an excess of biomass, uh, which really doesn't belong there. And what happens is that when, for example, in this picture, this is from the Caribbean, uh, this is the Sargassum seaweed. And in that region alone, we have 25 million tons of this biomass appearing every single year, and it doesn't go away. So what happens is that these invasive seaweed species, they actually take the living space from the good guys, so to speak. So they take away the oxygen, the living space. And what happens is that you will start to see the decrease in biodiversity. So less species uh, in that particular area. <clears throat> and also the fact that they are taking out the oxygen from this ecosystem, you start to see a lot of dead zones. So dead zones mean, means that basically you have no life in, in that area. So what we do, we actually utilize these invasive seaweed species as a feedstock, and then we refine them. So we are developing a biorefinery technology where we refine these seaweeds to the products which can be used in everyday goods. For example, in cosmetics, in food, in home and personal care. I will tell you more about the products later on. The other um, problem we want to tackle is the global chemical industry. And we all know that chemical industry is a very important part of our modern society. It has basically created the standard of life we have today. It has created all the single-use products, all the other products we are using, all the cosmetics, all the food, all the materials you are, you are using without even realizing it how much oil you have actually accumulated in your everyday life via these chemicals. Um, chemical industry has done a lot of good things as well, uh, but I think it's time to also look things from the different angle. And that's why we say that we also want to make the chemical industry run on algae. So we have a regenerative business model. So as I mentioned, we are in the middle of this value chain. So you see our novel biorefinery in the middle. Um, this is what we do. This is the heart of Origin BioOcean. So we are developing this biorefinery technology, or we have developed, where we can take these invasive seaweed species I showed you, and then we can refine them into the products which can go into your everyday goods. So when we enter the everyday goods you use at home, we actually decarbonize different markets from cosmetics, food, home and personal care, textiles. So our products can really be everywhere. So when you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you use toothpaste, we are in there. So you shower yourself, shower gel, soaps, these ingredients go in there. In a cosmetics where you need to have certain functions, our products, are also there. So it's very important to understand that when you have a regenerative business model, you actually want to regenerate um, the ecosystems where you function. And when we take these invasive seaweed species out from the sea, we actually take the nutrients with that. So we are helping the marine ecosystem with this nutrient load, hence eutrophication they are suffering from. And, and we use that kind of a waste uh, to give good products for people and for the, for the brand owners. And while we do that, we are substituting the oil-based ingredients. So we are decarbonizing these markets where we can bring the bio-based solutions. 
Um, these are our products. Um, the one of the golden rules of uh, biorefinery technology is that you have to um, have multiple products out from the same feedstock. So um, I always say that in a biorefinery, you have to squeeze as much as value as you can out from, from one feedstock. And this is what we do. So these products are highly functional. So functionality is one of the key things in this ingredient business where we are in. So we are selling these products as ingredients. We are B2B. And uh, we also help our customers to formulate them into the final product. So it's very important that in the final product, being that a cosmetic product or home and personal care product or a food um, product, you have to have a functionality. So we are not just producing ingredients to basically be there, not really having any real functionality, but we want to give our customers sustainably produced and highly functional products. So these guys, they do very different things. Um, they are antioxidants. Um, we have emulsifiers, we have stabilizers, we have so-called viscosity modifiers. Um, we have UV filters, as I will show you the sunscreen case we have, and we also have pigments. So we have a kind of a product portfolio, which is very wide. And this way we can enter uh, a different uh, market, which have a very nice uh, global market growth. Um, this is our sunscreen solution. I'm actually very, very proud of that. I almost started crying when I got this bottle in my hand. It's been my dream. Um, to have a, a purely bio-based UV filter in, uh, in a sunscreen area. Uh, this is Cyaneo. It comes from the blue-green algae. So blue-green algae blooms, everyone knows from the Baltic Sea that they are toxic and they are harmful. So you can't go swimming when you have, when you have the, um, the cyanobacteria bloom. So this is uh, originating from that guy. And uh, we have also formulated that into the final sunscreen product. And it, it has been tested in a, a certified a sunscreen labs to have a very high uh, protection of SPF 22 with the very low dosage. So when I mentioned the functionality, that's really like highlighting it. So efficacy is very high. And, uh, and that's one of, one of the key things here is that you only need to add very little to get uh, very high, very high performance. So we are very proud of that. That's actually very safe for you to use and it's also safe for the oceans. So many sunscreens today are uh, chemical based. They are using chemical UV filters. Uh, they are harmful for you and they are harmful for the oceans. And that's why EU will ban um, certain amounts of these UV filters in the future. And there is a clear need for more sustainable solutions. So we are definitely answering also that a uh, global need. As I mentioned before, uh, if you're not very familiar with this type of a B2B ingredient business, um, it might be kind of difficult to understand the value chain, but basically what we are looking at that we will be in the consumer products. Uh, we have built a co-branding business model. That means that we want to have our logo, you see on that label that there is written by Ocean and we want to be there. And it will be a clear message to the consumers that when you buy this product is safely produced, there, there are good ingredients which are safe for you and for the oceans. And definitely we will be everywhere because when you are producing ingredients, um, you have kind of an endless opportunity of products where you can be part of and bring the functionality. Uh, we have first demo products ready and we will actually have the first uh, commercial line coming out next spring. Maybe a few words about the maturity. So how you build something like that. We are very uh, industrial uh, company. So that means that we are going uh, forward to build our first production uh, plant here in Finland. Um, so as I said, we were established in 2019 and we closed our seed investment round in 2020 with 2 million euros. And that meant that we could start the whole process development, which has been a hobby of mine for a very long time. Um, so we've been doing that now for uh, two years and we have already started the piloting phase and um, the piloting will be our main activity, taking now the process development from the lab to the pilot. So we are increasing the scale. 
And the next phase, of course, is the brick commercial production, where we want to start selling the ingredients and have offtake agreements um, with our customers so that when the first uh, industrial production plant is ready, uh, we can sell the whole capacity. So it's a very exciting time. We actually uh, published our um, piloting partner here in Finland, uh, Kempolis OY. Uh, they are located in Oulu in the north. And uh, it's very exciting to be able to work with them um, throughout this piloting phase and, and really going, going um, forward uh, with the production and, and scaling, scaling up. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mari. That was a, a lovely presentation. Um, and uh, we will start with a, with a joint discussion, but before that, I, I have a, a small question, Mari, for you. And you, you have a new technology, uh, you have this process, um, and you're saying you're, you'll be everywhere. So you're really, uh, you're able to, to um, contribute to, to different um, markets. How has it, how, how have you managed to, to balance the research, the, the technology, and then being able to enter a market where it has already been established by these chemical companies before and, and you coming in and, and saying, you know, add us. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's a, it's a hell lot of work. <laughs> so first of all, you have to know, uh, you have to know the chemical industry very well. So uh, you have to know how these big boys play and how the market actually works. Uh, you have to know the drivers, you have to understand the ingredients, and you have to be able to tell your potential customers and your partners why it's good to change a certain ingredient and what's the benefit that they will gain. And that's why our business model, when I was talking about this regenerative business model, we can also wrap our ingredients into this sustainable wrapping. So we give them basically a lot of information for the marketing. So then they can say that, okay, right, we are using Oritin by Oceans, let's say two ingredients in the product. That means that we have removed X and Y amount of nutrients in the ocean, like from the ocean. And, uh, and then we have removed certain amounts of CO2 or they have decarbonized their product. So we help them also with that. And it's very important that you have to help them with the marketing. So they will have a certain edge. Plus the other thing is that you have to help them to formulate the product. So this is not a thing that you just like substitute one and add the other, but you actually have to rework the form. We always talk about the formulation. So that's very the key that you have to be able to do that as well. You have to give this so-called technical support to your customers. And this is, this is what we do. So with our team, we are now 20 people. We also have two formulators from the industry. And uh, that's very important that these guys can, can really help them to have the final product. And, uh, and that's why they, they liked us. And there is a huge pressure now to decarbonize. It's massive. Everyone, because our, you know, all of us, all the consumers, we understand more. We are more aware of the ingredients. There are a lot of apps that you can scan the QR codes and you get all that information. So also the brand owners are well aware of that. And that's why many big brands like Unilever and P&G they are running now uh, decarbonization strategies and uh, and they're looking at alternatives so I, I think the timing for us is is perfect and uh, and I'm just really really excited to see that that uh, now there is kind of this like massive wave happening that uh, that people want to have they are demanding for more sustainable products yeah thank, thank you um, and uh, a, a question coming from or related to to what you just mentioned and this this is for all speakers um Mary, you mentioned the regenerative business model so i had a question when you're thinking about a company you, you somebody who's not who's who comes from academia fully um you think about this big building that is making profits and that's pr producing some product and selling it and and, and focusing on on economic profitability so where we have to now move towards a future that is really um, careful in how we consume and how we treat our waste um, how is a new how are companies how do they have to re 
rebrand themselves and how do they have to rework themselves? Because for example, um, Origin by Ocean, you have your, as your values, you have sustainability, fairness, and freedom. And that may not be something that's very common in all, in all companies. Um, um, for example, um, uh, Megasense, you are working with different um, companies as well. And some of them are prioritizing open, open source. Um, so how do you work how do you how do you become a profitable company and include all these values that you are now introducing? So if we could start with Mari, for example. Yeah, I, I think for us it's uh, it's clear that without these values we wouldn't exist. So um, I think you shouldn't establish a startup today if you want to do it in an old way. There is like there is no reason for it. I mean, we have we have been massive corporations in this world that they have started hundred years ago, and good for them. But uh, but the thing is that you have to think differently. So when you look at the business models and KPIs of today, um, profitability is very important because it's enabling us to do good things. So without money, it's very difficult to do, uh, let's say, a scalable. Uh, a scalable good thing for the environment, let's put it in this way, uh, you need to have a, a huge scale of activities in order to have an impact. And uh, especially when we look at this eutrophication, that's why it's very important for us to be able to have these massive production scales so that we can have a positive impact. So money is important. I'm always saying that um, uh, the rules of the capitalism, uh, they are changing. They are changing the, the kind of the angle, how you view it. And what are actually the important KPIs that you're looking at as a company? Um, we are a value-based company. It's very important. Uh, I think it's the only way to work uh, as a human being is that you are, you are treated equally and, and there is an openness and fairness and freedom and all the things uh, that we can all bloom. Because um, I don't, I, I I don't believe in the old days that uh, you maybe had a, a a bit of a different way of like controlling people and and leading people. I think we've seen that and it has had its time, but now it's time to do things in a in a very different way. So what I want to say is that a profitability is very important in order to have a good impact. Definitely. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Um, Andrew? Yeah, so uh, it's a very good question. And um, I think um, what was introduced just now about scalability, um, that, that's our, our focus is, is about scale. That um, because we are software and very much based on sharing knowledge, um, but sharing accurate knowledge so people can take action, um, we, we are scalable from day one because um, we, we don't rely on industrial production. We, we uh, we work on data and we work on knowledge that people have in terms of their exposure to um, to air quality and to take action. And uh, our focus actually is very much on young people. Um, so young people sort of feel dis disfranchised. I mean, a lot of people focus on the the elderly, the people with the money um, to buy products. But but we want to sort of focus on when we you know, because we have children and all that, they're very uh, interested in the environment. They're interested in, you know, who's controlling the traffic. They want to cycle more. They want to be outside more. And um, so we provide app and information for them to sort of provide this sort of solutions for themselves, for their peer groups, and also to uh, to take action. So although we don't have these sort of values in print, you know, we're going to do this, but in the back of our minds, it's all about improving the environment, you know, uh, to sort of bring in this um, green mobility to, to, to en enable people to cycle more, but to also have um, a belief that when they go cycling, they're not actually uh, putting themselves at risk, you know, because they are, uh, they're running, they're breathing more, and they're actually breathing in more air pollutants than someone who's avoiding it. So um, there is a trade-off at the moment in, in many of these cities, like in Barcelona, that if you go out and you do a physical exercise, actually you, you come back worse than, than if you didn't do that because you've just ingested 
a, a huge amount of chemicals and pollutants. So, so we want people to know that, um, to take action and to sort of lead this change, change so we can go towards the so-called Green Deal and, and the sort of future we want with less fossil fuels, uh, more electrification. So although we don't have these values built in, it, it, it's built in just, just in our principle of what we're about. Um, and of course, by understanding uh, air quality, you understand the use of energy so that um, we have people like um, Kony and Nokia, you know, they're looking at um, emissions as a sort of loss. Um, so, you know, how can they reduce those losses? You know, they, they need to have the information and they need to have that in real time and they need to have that type of uh, information so that they can uh, adapt their equipment or adapt their their processes so that they emit less and they lose less energy so so we can measure that we provide that information in real time and in different methods so um yeah so i think um we, we're very much based on um on this green deal and bringing in the uh, green future okay thank you thank you andrew uh dalia you you're ready to to say something <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean uh, of course a profit is important for any company if there is no profit you cannot run a company and it, it, uh, it will end relatively fast so profit is always important now talking about scalability mm, this is i think this is this goes without saying for me and i think down animal health down technology is very scalable where was a strategic reason why we are not called B Health or B Health Company because it, it's bees are just the beginning for us because the technology that we're developing, the vaccination approach we're developing is scalable to all the egg-laying animals on earth. And a lot of invertebrates belong here. Also a lot of fish belong there. So, and a lot of those animals are very important, not only in ecosystems, but also in our agricultural systems or, or in our food networks, for example, shrimps uh, and shrimp diseases. So how do we handle those right now? We also, we dump a lot of antibiotics in those ponds and who finishes eating those, we do. And of course, we all know how bad antibiotics in, in our health uh, so we need to decrease that. And this is one of the visions of down so that we will really improve arthropod health or insect health so that our food, what is more and more going to contain, contain insects, by the way, because, you know, the alternative protein source are the insects, like we have them already in muesli and energy bars, crickets. Uh, and so when they are grown for human consumptions, they are grown in high densities and they will get sick. Like all the individuals, when they are packed together, they will transmit diseases and we need to handle it. And obviously we cannot do it with antibiotics. So we need alternative methods for that. And vaccination is, is I always call it a breakthrough technology. It was from 1792, but it was a breakthrough in medicine. And it has made it to our everyday life, whether it's about humans or our pets or, or chickens. I mean, the eggs we are eating come from vaccinated chickens. Uh, we vaccinate even fish now and then, for example, salmon, then we release them. Or cows, the milk comes from vaccinated cows. So now it's time to also take care of insect health because they are so important for our existence or on a life on earth as we know it. So. Would you like to go for a walk in a forest where there are no birds and flowers anymore on the meadows? Because this is what we're going to be facing. And um, this is vision of Dallin to improve and help to stop this, what is happening and improve our lives. Thank you. And I have um, a related question. By the way, I'm Mexican, so we eat we eat grasshoppers. So I, I know this insect eating. Um, but, but then uh, we've... Um, Andrew, for example, you, you listed um, um, a lot of consequences of having air quality, a good air quality, going from crime rates to um, beauty and so on. And, and Dalia, you mentioned how important insects are to our food security, um, biodiversity. And all, so there's a lot of, it, there's a whole network of, um, of benefits to, to having clean air, good biodiversity and so on. So who pays for this? Who's, who's gonna pay for uh, a bee vaccine? Who's gonna pay for having um, the information of where to go you know, when it's uh, a clean air route? Is it, is it the user? Is, should cities be more involved? Um, how, do we, how do we share the responsibility? 
Okay, maybe I can start off um, with that. So, so we are launching a subscription-based service. So it will be the uh, private user. So they will, um, they can download an app uh, uh, from that app. Um, we have to decide what is free and, and what is payable. But um, but but uh, we already have this app both for, for Google and for Apple phones. And and so you download an app, and um, it's like a navigation tool. So then uh, you'll pay a subscription, um, a small subscription on a monthly basis. Um, and then uh, um, and then we'll provide more and more information for you. So and then you'll have your own uh, profile and your own history. Um, so then you can look back on what you did last year and, and the routes you took. Um, that'll be stored for you. And if, if you have a particular health issue, then that'll be very important for you, you know, if you're suffering from asthma. Um, but then we will build upon that app and, and provide, because it'll be based on forecasts as well. So ours will be very much a subscription based. And, and because it's scalable from day one, because we have these models working and we provide a whole city. So, you know, we expect quite a reasonable growth in subscribers. Um, there are very many cyclists are very keen to sort of uh, understand um, the impact of when they go for a cycle, what is the cleanest route? And they're very, uh, if you're a jogger, then again, you know, you might be concerned uh, if you're running across, uh, uh, alongside a highway you know what is the impact sometimes the impact is nothing and, and that's what we want to also tell people that there are areas in the city that are very clean so you know people think the whole city is is dirty there are areas which are which are as good as any other city so um but that will be a subscription app service um and we will um develop the features uh, as we sort of progress i mean we're, we're launching uh, beginning of next year and um so it's very much um going to be marketed um but but very simplified and then probably we will have some form of social media channel so people can communicate uh, amongst their peers on, on actions that they can take and like i said before um we are thinking more of, of a younger generation of, of making changes well, in our case, it's it's more traditional, I guess. Of course, it's it's the people who, in a first line, when we talk about our first product, um, you know, the beekeepers, potentially growers, almond growers, for example, of course, will benefit directly from having more bees to pollinate their crop, and more bees means more crops. So, but in in a first line, of course, we are talking about beekeepers, queen breeders. Um, since vaccine is targeted towards the queen, so it's it's more classical this way. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to ask the audience, do you have any question? Otherwise, I'll just keep going. So, so please, um, if you do have a question, just uh, either type it on the chat or just go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourselves and ask. If not, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll continue with, with a question I already had before for Dalia, which is when, um, you already have, as you mentioned, um, farmers waiting for you, bee, bee, beekeepers, not farmers, beekeepers waiting for, you, <laughs> for your vaccine. Um, how, how have you worked with them? Um, and I'm also thinking of once you have a, a, a vaccine, how easy is it um, for them to become engaged with it and acquainted and, and, and use, yeah, to use uh, your, your technology? Um, and incorporated in their practice. Uh, so it's actually been a lot of outreach from our side. So we have an entire commercial team going out, uh, talking to beekeepers, talking to queen breeders, visiting their facilities, uh, and just uh, introducing the technology and the approach. Our approach is doesn't really need too much modifications of our standard procedures. Like you said, we're just mixing it to the uh, sugar feed, what the breeders are giving anyway, and mixing anyway themselves. In this case, they just add vaccine there. So uh, it should be very simple to adapt in a bigger scale. And we already have, uh, of course, prototypes. We've been testing it. Uh, we're testing it uh, continuously. And also for our first years, of course, our commercial team will go out and help them and uh, make the demonstrations. This is how we do it. We have webinars, we have videos, uh, and of course, very good manual how to use it. And we continue outreach. We try to talk on all the beekeeping events and where the, the beekeepers and breeders come out. And, and so we can introduce our technology. 
And um, actually, I also have to say that I also almost cried when I had a prototype in my hand printed uh, bacterium for the honeybees for vaccination honeybee queens. It was it was really eye watering moment after all these years. It's a real product in your hand. It's 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 fantastic feeling. Yeah, congratulations for that. Um, Marty, uh, a question about scalability. You, you're you um, harvesting seaweed that is already there, but do you have any plans to harvest your own, to to harvest, is that is that the right word, to harvest your yeah. own seaweed? Or would that be not be necessary? So what, what do you mean, harvest our own? So um, you're now collecting seaweed, but would there be a point to scale it even further where you'll where you'll have your own sort of seaweed farms. Yeah. So the thing is that we are using uh, when I mentioned that we are using these invasive seaweed species. So they are being harvested. Uh, they're you know they're widely grown. We don't want them to be there, but they are there because of this eutrophication. Um, so there are already existing technologies we are using to harvest that. So we also have uh, activities in the Caribbean region. And uh, after we won the UN Global Innovation Challenge, in, I think it was in twenty twenty. Uh, when UN came our partner, they helped us to establish this network to the Caribbean because these people are suffering from this 25 million tons of sargassum every year. It's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And they already have the technologies to harvest that so that they can keep their everyday lives going. And, uh, and that's where we have uh, collaborators there. We have companies who are harvesting that for us. So we actually want to be the customers and buying this feedstock from them. Uh, in the Baltic Sea, we harvest the cyanobacteria, so the blue-green algae, and uh, we also farm uh, Fucus vesiculosus, so the bladder rack. And the bladder rack is the good guy of the Baltic Sea. It's our kind of a coral reef, and uh, and that's where we want to we want to farm it, so we can have uh, more of it because we don't the population has decreased quite a bit, so we want to have more of that good stuff, and also the fact that, <clears throat> sorry it's removing uh, nitrogen. And that's very important in the Baltic Sea is that we need to have more tools to remove the nutrients from the water body. And, uh, and bladder rack is, is playing a crucial role there. So we have a, a, a partner Nordic Trout, which is the biggest fish farmer in Finland. Uh, we are using the infrastructure for the farming. Then we also have two other locations, one in Orland and then, um, and then one in the, in the Turku region. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, it's really nice to hear that you're you're taking, you're, you're passing this on to other groups of people that need this. It's I think that's a, something. Um, I mean, as a scientist myself, when we're thinking about how to pass on capacitation or training, and not just take, but rather um, pass the tools on. I think it's really it's really nice that you do that. Um, we, I just want to mention that that's one of our key drivers. Is that uh, if you look at the people living in a coastal area especially in Finland, they don't have a lot of jobs there. Like, the, like if you think about the fishermen, there is no fish to fish from the Baltic Sea. So it doesn't matter how much money the government is giving them to survive, but it's not bringing the fish into the Baltic Sea. And that's why we want to utilize also the infrastructure they have and give them a new business. But of course we have to develop, so we have developed like a, a manual how to farm bladder rack. And then we can pass that on to them and say like, look, you know, this is how you do it. And then of course we will be the customers and, and ensuring that they have a business uh, coming from that. Thank you to the three speakers. We have uh, basically a couple of minutes left. So I'd like to ask one final question to all of you. Um, coming from a research background, um, what would be your advice or best practice in how, how you move towards uh, working in a company or establishing your own companies. If we can go in order, maybe uh, Andrew, if you could start and, and then follow by Dalia and, and then Marie. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a quite a challenging question because um, when you work in re research, you, you work at such a scale that the um, that it's just yourself you know you have this problem and you think everyone else has that problem as well um so um but then when you um so you know for instance we think okay air pollution you're waking up in the in delhi and, and you're coughing so but it's, it's very much personalized but then um 
But then thinking about the customer who's going to pay for your um, product, I think that, that that that's what we don't really learn. You know how to sort of um, um, transform what we're researching into something that someone will pay for and they see value in their own lives. So. Um, Research is very much um, based on an abstract thing and, and often personalized. Um, we can see here, I can see you're very, uh, bo both um, Daniel and Maria are very um, personally attached to either insects or to um, to sort of denitrifying the um, uh, the Baltic Sea. Um, and of course, they're, they're, they're highly valued and I can see the point in that, absolutely. But, you know, but then when you talk to someone on the street, they'll say, well, I don't care, you know. <laughs> um, I'm living my own life and I'm not interested in bees. You know, it's just there in the shops or, you know, I'm not interested in the sea. It's something I go swimming in maybe once a year. So so I think uh, that that connection from the research to, to the average person. Uh, it's not that we should always consider that, but that's something that we've learned. So now we are trying to think about what does an average person think about air quality? Do they care about it or not? And how can we, uh, what would they pay for that? What What is that value? Um, and so that that's the journey we're on at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot has been already said, but I think for me, when I, I really come from very basic research background. So I've been always curious about how organisms are adapting to environment and what's happening inside of the organism and how they do it. And the immunity is a wonderful platform because it's on demand. If there are no pathogens, you don't need immune system. If there are pathogens, you need them. So it's it's been really fueled by shared curiosity. But once... Um, we made this discovery in Helsinki and I was like, it's been something what I've been thinking already before. Could it be that it happens this way? And then we made this discovery and I thought like, hell, but that's really could be a real product. It's, um, and it could make a change. And the scalability, because I mean, when I saw these glowing dots in honeybee overs, for me, it was clear, oh, that probably happens in all the egg laying animals on earth. And it has such a potential also to be a real world product to solve a problem we have a severe problem to solve this problem with this research and i just so wanted to be part of it and take this message out and i think it's been a fascinating journey i wouldn't change it against any we need it why it's important because sometimes i don't like honey anyway it's not about honey it's it's about a way of life on, on the planet, what we're really, really tackling. So yeah, I think just also, it's very curious to see as academics, I think we are curious to see how things work out. It's, it's very curious to develop a real world product out of academic research. Right. And it's not trivial, I have to tell you, it's really not trivial, but it's fascinating. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's also important to understand that not every researcher needs to be an entrepreneur, uh, definitely not. I, I think um, universities are putting now a lot of effort for this uh, spinning of companies and, and also the government, and I can see that happening. But I also value greatly uh, the research, the academic, the, the purest of the pure academic research done at the university. And we should not forget that is as important as the entrepreneurship. And, uh, and I think we should find also a balance. It's not, I mean, I think you hear a lot of cool stories about entrepreneurship and, and startups and all that, but it's damn hard work. I mean, it's, it's constant uh, closing one round and, and finding another, you know, pot of money and talking to investors and, and doing a, a, a lot of work. So, so you have to be also aware of the fact that you will be taken away from this, uh, you know, this nice kind of a flask that you were holding in your hands at one point, it will be very far away from you at one day. And, uh, and, and I think that's good to remember. And also the fact that if someone really wants to do this, uh, this giant leap uh, from the university premises to the business world, you have to find the right people. It's wrong to believe that you can do it yourself. You cannot, um, you, you need to have the best team to support with you and have extensive advisors around you from different angles and stuff like that. So I think that's for me personally, is the most fascinating part is the fact that you will end up working with such a cool bunch of people. Like 
if you have a if you have a, a big course and you love it yourself people will come and uh, it's amazing like our team of 20 I have never met such individuals in my entire life I have in my past have a team of you know 50 people in my you know in my group when I was an R&D director uh, but I've never worked with such a dedication and pure heart and uh, it's just uh, it's amazing and, uh, and and I think that you also need to as a founder you carry a lot of responsibility you carry responsibility of your team and uh, when you have a company it changes things a lot and um, and I think it's always good to do this kind of thinking in your head that am I really the right person to do that or do I really want to do it and if not there are a lot of other ways of of doing cool stuff and important stuff like you know my colleagues here what they've been talking about it's very important to tackle these environmental issues from different angles because they are there and they are real thank you very much to our three speakers Mari I'm looking forward to using your sunscreen Daniel I hope you get uh, your vaccine approved very very soon uh, Andrew good luck with Megasense OI uh, this coming month um, thank you to all our speakers uh, Chiara my co-host thank you for your support even though your voice was gone but at least we can uh, she can wave um, and then I will give now the floor to Rashad for the next talks. Right. Uh, I'd like to, on my behalf, thank all the speakers. A truly insightful talk, I have to say. Uh, it's uh, always a privilege and eye-opening to have scientists to have these health talks uh, who have true um, extensive background in the field. And I could, I could, couldn't agree more with uh, the last things Mari said in terms of entrepreneurship. And I do encourage everyone to join uh, this path as hard as it may be. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone again, all the attendees. And uh, we have two more events at least already scheduled for the fall. Uh, one of them is again with Highlight and Alto. Uh, it's on the uh, researcher's path in entrepreneurship, how to be a founder, how to uh, license out a company and uh, how to be an entrepreneur. Um, and then one with Tampere Health, Health Hub, and that's going to be on secondary use of health data. But you'll hear more about all of that if you're subscribed to Health Docs newsletter. All right. Now, thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. It's a sunny day. Enjoy it as much as you can and see you again next time. Bye. Thank you very much. Nice talking. Thank you. Bye-bye then.